Now, the leaders of the other 27 EU countries are gathering in Brussels today to, amongst other things, firm up their position on Brexit. And our Brussels reporter, Adam Fleming, is there. Adam, tell me what they're discussing. So, Joe, uh, the way I've been putting it this morning is that Brexit isn't the theme tune for this summit, but it is the background music, if you like. It sort of runs through lots of things. So they're going to talk about the future composition of the European Parliament after 2019, because there will no longer be 73 British MEPs there. They're going to talk about the successor to the Spitzen candidate process, uh, by which Jean-Claude Juncker was uh, made president of the European Commission. Uh, his term of office is up next year, so how will his successor be chosen? Then they've got the really, really thorny issue of the MFF, the multi-annual financial framework, which, as we all know, is the seven-year budget cycle for the EU, which will start in 2021. And it will have a Brexit-sized hole in it of potentially 15 billion euros a year. So lots of difficult conversations between net contributors who pay in and don't necessarily want to pay in any more, and net recipients who don't necessarily want to receive any less, while there's increasing demands on the EU's budget when it comes to security and migration. And so that discussion will go on for months and months and months and months. And in terms of Brexit, the only bit actually formally on the agenda today is that Donald Tusk, the president of the council, will update the 27 leaders on the process that he will go through to write their next set of guidelines for the next phase of talks about trade and the future relationship, which the 27 will sign off in this building when they next meet on the 23rd of March. Now, Adam, the EU appears to have rejected a key British proposal for the future relationship after Brexit, these so-called baskets where you could have sort of variance in, in relations uh, post-Brexit. Um, and this is according to documents that were published by the European Commission. But in your opinion, are the EU 27 still singing from the same hymn sheet? Is there any sign of divergence, to coin a phrase? Uh, yeah, that's the word we all use yeah. um, all the time, it yes. seems, at the moment. Yes, very fashionable. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that, docu that document yesterday that emerged was um, a presentation that was given by the European Commission Brexit negotiators to the diplomats from the 27 a couple of weeks ago, which talked about this three baskets approach that the Prime Minister has as her basis for the discussion uh, about the future relationship. And they said it was incompatible with the European Council's guidelines for Brexit. And they pointed out that uh, it meant that the UK was cherry picking, taking what bits of the single market that it liked, which threatened the integrity of the single market. They pointed out that it threatened the, the autonomy of the EU's decision making because it would mean that the UK on the outside would be too involved on decisions happening on the inside. They said there would have to be a role for the European Court of Justice if the UK was still going to rely on concepts in EU law. And they also said, oh, what about Norway, who, because they're in the European economic area, might get annoyed about the UK getting this kind of deal. Now, they were very firm. That that is against all the guidelines that were drawn up by the 27 in April last year, right at the start of this. But I'm detecting subtle little hints of where things are changing. Now, this is going to sound incredibly geeky, so bear with me. <laughs> the Swedish Board of Trade, which is the trade agency that advises the Swedish government, uh, has just written a 260-page report about Brexit and its impact on the Swedish economy. It's all in Swedish, but they've released a four-page summary in English, Thank which goodness. says a one-size-fits-all model for the UK and Sweden is not appropriate for the Swedish economy. They say for some sectors of the Swedish economy, mm. it would be best if the UK remained in the EEA. For some sectors of the Swedish economy, it would be better if there was a deep and special trade relationship like the one the EU has with Ukraine. For some parts of the Swedish economy, it would be better to be like Switzerland, where they have loads of bilateral deals about different sectors. And they say a plain free trade agreement like the EU has with Canada or Japan would not eliminate barriers to trade and effectively wouldn't be good enough. Now, to my ears, does that mean they are criticizing Michel Barnier's it's Canada, it's the best you're going to get approach? Or are they criticizing the UK's red lines and saying, well, actually, you're going to have to dilute some of those red lines in some of those areas? Or is it both or is it neither? And I suppose that's what we're going to be looking for in the next month. More clues about exactly what do the member states think about this future relationship. Well, Adam, thank you. And thank goodness there was that translation uh, from the Swedish Board of Trade. <laughs> that would have left you in a bit of a stymie. Now, we're joined from Rome by the Italian MEP Roberto Gualtieri, who is on the European Parliament's Brexit steering group. Welcome to the programme. I don't know how much of the last discussion you just heard, but we're already hearing that Brussels is rejecting Theresa May's approach of managed divergence. Why? 
actually this is not true we are uh, respectively uh, waiting for uh, understand what is exactly the UK proposal we understand there will be a speech of the Prime Minister uh, next week and uh, then we will uh, uh, define uh, our guidelines. Uh, we have only said that we want uh, a relationship with the United Kingdom which is as close as possible, but of course any kind of relationship has its own uh, balance of rights and obligation. Right. Single market has and some rules, a custom union and other rules, and uh, if there are red lines that prevent uh, those solutions, then we enter into the category of a free trade agreement, which of course has to be negotiated. Right, but you say you don't know what Britain uh, wants and therefore nothing has been rejected. But that's not the case, is it, Roberto? Because uh, the Prime Minister and the government has put forward this proposal of three baskets, where you would have some mutual recognition in some areas, some close alignment and some divergence. And we know now from the Commission that they've rejected that. So I say again, why has that been rejected out of hand? Honestly, I, again, I don't understand what are we talking about. We have not received a formal position, complete position. We have heard speeches uh, hinting of these baskets, which is not a totally clear concept. We know that uh, in a free trade agreement, if if um, if um, if uh, UK is not in a custom union, if it's not in a single market, mm. of course we cannot have a totally frictionless trade. Then we have to negotiate a free trade agreement, and the level of market access will depend on a number of factors. We can have a very good uh, level of market access for goods in services, a bit more difficult. Of course, uh, as uh, the Swedish document that was just uh, uh, quoted uh, says, uh, if uh, we in, in a free trade agreement is impossible to have a frictionless trade because if you want a frictionless trade, you need to stay in the single market, the Casamio. But this is. I mean, these are right, only the basics. Then, right. of course, we have to enter into the negotiation and we need a, a clear position of the UK. And, of course, we will uh, present our guidelines uh, in the Parliament and the European Council in March. Right, but you do accept that countries, there are a number of countries, in fact, that do have special deals with the European Union. It's not strictly a case of remaining in the single market to get that frictionless trade or remaining in the customs union so that there is that complete alignment with rules of origin and regulations. For example, Turkey. It isn't bound by freedom of movement and has a customs union with the EU, but only on goods and not services. That's a bespoke deal. So why can't Britain have a bespoke deal? No, no but it, this is exactly a very good example. Uh, tri uh, Turkey is a member of a customs union, not the union customs union. Uh, this has some advantages uh, in terms of tariff. Of mm -hmm. course, Turkey is bound to have the same tariff uh, outside, so this means that there's some limitation in its uh, sure. trade policy, but as the benefit of uh, uh, less f uh, with less friction in a trade of goods. Of course, there are still some checks to be done because uh, yeah. Turkey is not in the single market. Right, but, but wouldn't course, that uh, yeah, but wouldn't that fit broadly with the approach of three baskets? I mean, Norway also has a special deal. Uh, it's I part of the single that. union, uh, single market. I'm sorry, but not the customs union. It has separate rules uh, for industries like farm produce and fish. So again. Britain could have a similar approach, mixing perhaps the two. But that's exactly the reason why we need to wait for what will be the proposal, because uh, something uh, uh, similar to Turkey is, uh, is, is, is different from uh, a free trade agreement, because uh, it implies some limitation in setting the external tariff that, of course, Canada does not have. But so far, we have heard that UK was excluding this option. Yeah. If it would move in that direction, would be a positive thing, of course, but uh, this has not been said. Yes, but we keep hearing from the European Union and Michel Barnier that Britain won't be allowed to cherry pick. But examples of Norway, Turkey and Switzerland, or in Switzerland's case, their bilateral agreements with the EU, to some extent, that is cherry picking. Um, and this has been rejected out of hand for Britain. Why? No, I, I, I insist uh, to disagree uh, with uh, your de description of how we are rejecting things. It's not, it's not true. We but the EU Commission that, uh, has rejected Turkey it. Turkey is a clear case uh, which has some uh, balance of right and obligation. If the UK chooses uh, to be bound by a, a custom union mm. in some element, it's a, positive, it's a positive fact that we are not rejecting at all. Switzerland is a bit different, but mm. I would like to remind that Switzerland has the freedom of movement, that the fourth freedom is, is applied yes. with Switzerland. I, I understand that the UK does not want this.
Is the EU27 still unified? Absolutely. I think we, are, we have been unified and we will be united because we have a very reasonable position. We want a relationship as close as possible with the United Kingdom. Uh, of course, each kind of relationship has its balance of right and obligation, and uh, we have to respect this principle. Uh, so we are open uh, to engage in negotiation as far as the UK will have a clear position, a clear proposal, and we will discuss. It would be also very useful, of course, to conclude quickly the discussion on the transition, because that's also an element of certainty. Uh, we are close, not yet there. I hope that a number of points that uh, are still uh, uh, open, will be positively solved and uh, uh, the very reasonable proposal of the European Union with some adaptation, of course, it could be uh, the basis of an agreement so we could move to, to, to this last phase, which is crucial, of course. OK, Roberto, just stay with us um, while I bring my other guests into the discussion. Tim Stanley, what do you make of what Roberto Gualtieri is saying, despite some of the language that has come from the European Union about not wanting Britain to cherry pick? Does he have a point that it's still not clear exactly what Britain is after. That's very true, but it's also, uh, obviously from what he said, not entirely clear what Europe will eventually agree to. I'm loving this discussion this morning because we're seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> at the beginning of the ne negotiating process, everything tended to feel like it was on the side of the EU because they were trying to get as much money out of us. That was their focus at the beginning of the process. And they've got that. Because as you heard, and they've got it, because as you've heard, with us gone, they're down something like eight or nine billion. But now that we're moving on, while the Commission may well be saying one thing, Michelle Barnier may be saying one thing, which is divergence is not possible, you can't uh, cherry pick, which technically speaking is true from the EU's point of view. Interesting to hear that the individual representatives from different countries are all thinking, hang on, we sell to Britain's markets. They're thinking, well, why can't we do a deal? Because it's in everyone's benefit. What do you think about the idea of Britain's sort of managed divergence, which I'm sure can mean something to everyone um, in terms of sort of semantics and linguistic gymnastics? Do you think Britain is going to find it much more difficult once this is presented to the EU? I do, um, and I think it's, it's a better wheeze for dealing with the divergence within the Cabinet itself rather than with thinking about the negotiations, although it seemed to me there there was a bit of a chink of light in the sense of, you know, when you raised Turkey, the answer was, yes, well, they do have a customs union in particular areas. And so that, that does seem to open up the idea of different arrangements in different sectors, which, you know, Theresa May many months ago used to say repeatedly, uh, the customs union is, is, is not a binary question, you know, to which the Commission used to say, Absolutely, yes, it is. But, you know, perhaps it is a bit more complex than that. And this is why David Davis and other ministers are shuttling around like mad, visiting, you know, several European capitals every week because they very much hope to, to, to open up a little bit of a chink between Brussels and the EU27. On the transition, the implementation period, which uh, Roberta Gualtieri uh, mentioned, uh, do you think it is now becoming clear that Theresa May will have to give way on her proposal to change the rights for EU citizens coming during that two-year period? It's implicit in that the transition deal still doesn't feel that it's been nailed down. And the Times, of course, was reporting today that that's exactly what would happen. I think what Britain wants to maintain at this stage is as much flexibility as possible uh, because it's got to get its house in order, but also it doesn't want to put too much of a time limit on negotiations when it comes to discussing that future trade deal. So my view is that regardless of what the government may publicly say about rights or Ireland or any of this stuff, I, my suspicion is the transition is still going to be a movable feast. Roberto Gualtieri, thank you very much uh, for joining us today.